seconds, we're going to bring in our Facebook groups as well. So we appreciate your patience over there on YouTube while we get that going. You can always skip forward about 30 seconds if you're watching after the fact. And we are good. Come on, Atlanta Falcons fans on all Falcons. Facebook's still spinning here. We want to bring them in. We don't want to miss all of that group. I think we're about to get there. We go. Now we're live. Welcome in, everybody. This is the Falcons podcast. It is a crisp Wednesday morning, but I think the rain is gone in Atlanta and the Southeast. I'm looking forward to getting out and seeing some baseball, and I'm looking forward to talking some Falcons football with you. First off, my name is Scott Kennedy. I'll be your host today. This guy over here is Nick Kendall. He's in Seattle, so he wakes up bright and early to join us every day. Nick, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing okay. Got the little guy down to bed at about 10 yesterday, and he slept until four o'clock. Uh, but that means I've been up since four as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm taking the good with the bad. So I've been up for a bit. So sometimes I come in a little groggy. I've already had half of this and I filled it back up. So we're living life. Lion coffee. Shout out to them. They are the, uh, really what gets me going all of these days, uh, going right now, but doing well, getting excited. And we're less than a month away from the draft. So it's uh, it's good times. Yeah. I, uh, what we want to get into today, set up the show a little bit. We're going to get into what Raheem Morris was talking about yesterday at the NFL league meetings. And we'll probably finish with a mock draft because yesterday, last week, Nick said, I want to do a mock draft where we slow it down and we take the opportunity to trade back up into the at back end of the first round. I'm like, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. There's questions about that very thing already in the chat today. So we're going to, we're going to do a mock draft. We'll probably just end up doing the first round or we'll do two. Yeah. <laughs> or we'll do two and we might trade back, but we're definitely going to attempt to trade back up to try and get the player that we didn't get in the first. So let's mm -hmm. say Marvin Harrison drops. Well, guys, I'm taking Marvin Harrison at, at yeah. eight. Now I still need my edge. I could still use another corner. Maybe I figure out a way to get back there in the, in the back end of the first Raheem Morris was at NFL speaking at NFL league meetings this week. Lots of good things to say. A lot of times it's blah, blah, blah. Coach speak this, coach speak that. And I tune out, but I actually enjoyed listening to him speak. Some of the topics he hit on was Desmond Ritter, Calais Campbell, NFL draft, tampering. We'll get into all of those things today. But we go live on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Falcons podcast because we like having a conversation with you. So I want to say hello to some folks that came in early before we even came, before we even got started and had the conversation going early. Red Swarm says, good morning, Scott, Nick, and my friends in the chat wishing a wonderful Wednesday. Is it a, is it Eclipse Day or is that next week? Is that an emoji? That's next week. I think it's just happy good morning. The sun's okay. up. <laughs> okay, I got it. Because because the, the there's supposed to be a pretty major eclipse, major eclipse uh, next week. But coffee, I'll drink to that. Um, as Nick said, uh, Lion Coffee keeps us caffeinated. I am hitting the medium dark today. This bag's mm. empty because I've been hitting it hard. So uh, check out lioncoffee.com. They've been good to us. Hopefully God they'll awesome. be good to you. Uh, Captain is in here. Good morning, Vietnam. Great movie. Spectacular. I don't know if he won any awards, but he should have. Robin Williams for the portrayal of Adrian Cronauer. Uh, good morning to Go Dogs 23 Has a couple of questions in here. Uh, I'm going to rapid fire these, Nick, because I like all three of them. Uh, he says, good morning. If the Falcons get Hassan Reddick for a third, do you think the Falcons skip on an edge in this draft? If you get Hassan Reddick or not, edge is on the table and you could skip it as well. Uh, the draft, I always think, is big picture, uh, you know, three to five years down the line. And if you can take the best player at the a valuable position and you rank, let's say, Roma Dunze higher than Dallas Turner, you probably should take Roma Dunze. I know that you can probably get a better wide receiver later, but that's, I think there's a fallacy in almost you're overconfident in the analysis. I'd rather get the guy that I rate higher because there's such a high bust rate uh, for a lot of these guys. So I agree it's a deeper class and maybe you kind of factor that in a little bit, but not to the extent that I'm like, Oh, no matter what I'm getting a day two wide receiver. If I evaluate that uh, wide receiver in the top three as a special player, uh, then I probably take them. And that's regardless of rhetoric or not. I'm so, but, if you get Reddick, you can also take another pass rusher. You can never have enough. So a lot of options for this Falcons team to get better. It's fun to have options in the draft. Yes, it is. And I'm going to say it real quick, Go Dogs 23. Do you think the Falcons skip on an edge in this draft? No, I do not. As long as the Falcons have been around, have you ever heard them say, you know what? We've got too many pass rushers. We need to move one of these guys. I think you've got one guy right now that you're thinking of having a long-term future with this team, and that's Arnold Ebiketti. And I don't think he's necessarily a number one. 
So if you get Hassan Reddick, then he's a number one, and then you're looking to draft his long-term replacement also that you can put out there. Now you're talking three guys, maybe four guys. Falcons haven't gotten much out of D'Angelo Malone, and that one that one's kind of hurt. Used a third-round pick on him. But if you're going rookie, Hassan Reddick, wouldn't that be nice? Arnold Ebichetti, Lorenzo Carter, maybe D'Angelo Malone, special teams as a, as a fifth guy, possibly. Then you're starting to feel pretty good about the room. And, you know, if the, if, if Reddick is on the Falcons, does that make corner a bigger need? The three biggest needs on this team right now for me are edge corner safety. Raheem Morris basically said the same thing yesterday, talking about trying to get some younger players at defensive back. Yes, because the number one need for me right now is edge number two slash three, right in there, 1A, 1B for the next group. If you take you get your number one edge, then the number one priority for me becomes either starting safety or a corner opposite A.J. Terrell, Nick. Yeah, I'm probably edge and cornerback. I'm always going to be favorable to the more value positions. You can find a safety in free agency still. I'd be shocked if you didn't find a safety still. Uh, but it's harder to find those cornerbacks. I don't think this is the best cornerback class, but there's a lot of serviceable pieces uh, as well that you can find day two. And a couple of pretty good ones in the uh, the first round as well. So, again, lot a lot of options. I think that edge is a lot different where this year, if you don't get one of the top four, I mean, you're talking yourself into Braswell or uh, the other Penn state rusher whose name's escaping me right now. Adisa Isaac. Isaac and chop Robinson. Yes. Yeah. Adisa Isaac. So that's kind of your day two options there. And they go, they tend to go pretty quickly. So we'll, we'll see what happens with edge, but it's not the most flush draft class in the, uh, at the edge spot. Uh, good morning. Roy Osborne. He said he's drinking his, uh, his lion coffee. Awesome. So are we like I said, I, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't just plug them. Just they're good. I, it's, I, I partake. I'm not only a, a customer. I'm a, I'm a customer. Um, he says, good morning, Scott, or should I say Mr. ESPN? Uh, good morning, Nick. I don't know if you saw this last night on the, uh, the podcast that I was producing the, uh, building the Broncos. Nick didn't see it cause he wasn't there. Mm-hmm. They asked which of them HH guys, mile high huddle guys have the best chance of being on ESPN. And, um, Carl said me, I was flattered. Uh, and I was like, no, he said, and it was actually, the question was in the next 10 years. And I was like, no, I was on ESPN 10 years ago. Now I'm an old guy. So I, uh, I, I did all that stuff uh, in the past. So I've, I've been on in most of the papers on most of the channels, uh, especially when I was doing uh, recruiting, when I was mm-hmm. head of recruiting at scout talking, talking to those players. And then I did some NFL draft stuff at NFL network because the studio was like 10 minutes from my house in Culver city when I lived out in LA. So probably not anymore, but listen, I'm so much happier getting to spend time with y'all and not have to deal with the corporate BS at some of my former employers. They've been in the news again recently. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been interesting. Mark Schrader is coming in. He says, good morning, Scott coming in with some, some support as he has been there for us since the very beginning that we started doing this three years ago. We certainly appreciate you, Marks. It's good morning, Scott and Nick. Absolutely. Uh, Michael Ronquillo. Actually, Mark adds in and Nick. <laughs> That's hilarious. Mark, you're awesome. I uh, hope you're doing well out in Texas. Hope the weather is treating you well. It's cooler here. You know, it's it's mild winter. I'm half afraid of what that's going to do for summer here. Is it going to be just so freaking hot that nobody can breathe so thank you mark we love you it's, it's the bugs it's the bugs you got because if you don't get that the kill all the stuff on the ground it's well, you don't have to worry about it too much because it's too hot to go outside that's it's like, true. I'm, not, I'm not gonna get the bugs can't avoid that during uh summer baseball though so yeah. um it's uh sometimes you don't mind those 8 a.m games when yeah. uh except for the sun and all that kind of stuff but we're getting into here eddie uh Fujioka says, what flavor of Lion Coffee? Today, Today I've got uh, the medium dark, and it's one of my favorites. It is absolutely one of my favorites right here. Empty. That's a two-pound bag that I've burned through. So I, del- I'm delicious. The, uh, Michael, Sunrise, yeah. Ronquillo, right back here. Benefactor of the show. You're awesome. We love you, Michael. Yeah, I appreciate you, Michael. I'm drinking the macadamia and vanilla. Uh, I mean, I'm not above flavored coffee. I know some people are like, oh, how could you do that? Oh, it is so good, especially because those are locally sourced ingredients from the islands out there in Hawaii. So, uh, man, with the Kona coffee, it's it is impossible to beat. Uh, so God bless them. I'm missing sometime soon. Hopefully I can get out there and drink it in the mountains again out here in uh, Washington. But yeah, it's great. 
I haven't been out to Hawaii in a while. It was a lot easier to get out there when I lived in California. I went out yeah. like three times in my nine years out there and haven't been back since. I've been to Europe twice. It's a lot easier to get to London mm -hmm. than it is to get to Honolulu from Atlanta. Um, Michael, Mark, appreciate you. Mike Harvey, good to see you. Uh, he had a question about the tampering also and what it could possibly cost you. I, I, I hesitate to say what it could cost you you know the the dolphins lost i think a first and a third the owner was suspended for six weeks not allowed to attend games and they got a million and a half dollar fine that was extreme that was all tied into one there were three strikes on this one nick that we've gone through one it was tom brady two it was sean payton so double tampering on this three it was all tied up as part of the lawsuit the the racial discrimination lawsuit that uh Brian Flores, our former head coach, had against the Miami Dolphins in the NFL. I don't see all of that here for Atlanta. Uh, what is it? What does it cost you? I don't know. Hopefully, for the Falcons' sake, nothing. Hopefully, nothing. Um, I don't know how you prove all that stuff anyway, Nick. What what constitutes tampering? You know, directly calling the player. You know, because you're dealing with their agents every day. That's why these deals are done at twelve oh one when they're allowed to be announced. I just, wh where's the line here? Like if you, these guys are under contract and, but it's not, so you obviously have to wait for that, but this like exclusive negotiating period with the team agents talk, man, there's, it's just hypothetically, like hypothetically, if you hit the market, would a contract like this look good? If hypothetically we hit the market, it would look good. I mean, I just don't even know how you could enforce something like that. Uh, overall uh so i mean teams can you know piss and moan about you know the the tampering <laughs> window or anything like that but it's happening i mean from the senior bowl on you have all these agents and front office people uh talking and there's a lot of potential discussions and i just wonder if you like open up that can of worms here where does it stop i i, I just don't even know uh like like you mentioned oh the legal tampering period is open for five minutes and we have 10 contracts in they didn't work those <laughs> contracts out in five minutes, folks. Uh, it's the, I, I don't know. I think I this know. is a big can of nothing. I, I can't imagine there, there should be any action here. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Like I say, yeah. I hesitate. It just, it seems like, you know, the NCAA was such a joke. Now that it's opened up, they're almost completely irrelevant. But they would, yeah. they'd give you the death penalty for jaywalking because they couldn't control the, the $50,000 booster money that was going to these players. It, it was absolutely insane um kirby smart i this was <laughs> kirby smart at one of his previous stops got taken off the road for two weeks because he answered a recruit via it was via email or text one of them wasn't allowed but he he responded back you were allowed to contact them via email you weren't allowed to contact him via text, one or the other, whichever it was. It's on the same damn device. It's still right here. It's still right here on your phone. And he got taken off for for uh, taken off the road for two weeks. And meanwhile, there was another recruit who was getting paid a lot. And I said something at the fact. I'm like, and they ignore this. He's like, that's what I said. You know, so I don't know. Getting to this question, Mike, what do you think of Jordan Travis quarterback? at 109 i don't know much about jordan travis and this is why i asked nick how highly was he thought of before the injury you know how much could that hurt him hendon hooker was looking really good before he got hurt and still went pretty high was jordan travis a hendon hooker type or was he not as highly thought of anyway i don't think he was as highly thought of uh i could be wrong but watching him i didn't see an nfl caliber prospect uh, but what I have heard uh, about him is that people have been so impressed with the film work, the whiteboard work, and the character of the interviews of Travis that he's going to have a future coaching if he wants, and he's going to work his way into a room just because he's going to be an asset uh, in the, any quarterback room, in a locker room, uh, working through stuff. So he's going to get drafted somewhere day three. I think probably, I don't think the injury is probably going to impact him too much there what does he go from like round four to round five or six easy for me to say it's not money out of my pocket dropping those two rounds but uh he'll still get drafted somewhere but i don't think it's a talk of him like being a potential top you know 50 pick going down to day three he was probably always a day three pick 
Okay. We'll appreciate it. So, you know, that's not a bad shout at 109 might be a shade high, but that's day three. If mm-hmm. I carry the one, that's fourth round. Um, Keith and Ellen Johnson coming in with some stars over on Facebook. Appreciate you breaking the ice over there on Facebook for us, Keith or and Ellen. <laughs> the whole the whole family. So good morning, guys. Do you think they keep Taylor Heineke? Right now, yes. It, it looks like it. So there they talk about uh Raheem Morris talked about adding a third quarterback to the room. That would be could be a a draftee. Now, I don't think there's any way, any how, unless they absolutely love a guy that falls to the second round. Then, okay, mm-hmm. maybe you, you use a second-round pick. But other, other than that, I feel like third round or later, for sure, for one of these guys, take a developmental pick. You know, the, the guy I think that's that I see that has the most tools between arm strength and size, but d- doesn't play quarterback very well, <laughs> which is a good day three pick for a quarterback, is Joe Milton. Is, is somebody like that? Could you end up bringing him in? Sure. Is Spencer Rattler worth a shot in the third if he's still there at 74, 79? Yeah, I, I could see that too. Yeah. Uh, first or second round, I don't see it, Nick. It depends on how the board falls. Uh, I see that we have our guy Rusty in here talking about if Drake May falls to eight, uh, some Falcons connected person would say they'd take him. Well, yeah, okay. That's, I mean, he's a talented enough quarterback. If Caleb Williams fell to eight, too. I uh, obviously take him. I don't see that happening. And I also don't see you guys in a position now where you're going to be aggressive and trade up given what the cost would be. But yeah, if you like a quarterback enough and you probably take a swing still, uh, we'll see what happens. I do really like the, um, the Rattler shout there. I also think Bo Nix, if he falls to day two is somebody I would consider for the Falcons as well in this, in this scheme. Uh, I think that round two is honestly on the table, depending on how the quarterback, how you evaluate them, it would have to be, the right fit, the right guy. Um, And you're not going in thinking we have to come out of a quarterback here. You're not desperate. But if you see somebody that's like, listen, Kirk's coming off an injury. He's got, you know, three years and we get somebody who can come in and we love for the system and the scheme fit. Sure. So I'd be open to it as early as round two, better uh, round three, as you mentioned, but I wouldn't shut the door either. Yeah. I'm not closing the door on anything. Anything's possible. I just think the possibility of them, the probability of them taking a quarterback in the first two rounds is, is slim. It's it's yeah. it's slim on this. Leon Mapstone over on Facebook has a good question and some news we wanted to get to. Uh, with Cordero Patterson gone, signed to the Steelers, do you think Tyler Algier and Bijan will be enough of a tandem? And I would like to see Pitts over the middle and moved out wide some. What do you think? Uh, Pitts plays a lot out wide. 75% of his snaps are either in the slot or out wide. Less than 20%, less than 25% are in line as a tight end. So he's been a receiver of sorts, whether it's slot receiver, wide receiver. He he moves a lot. What I want to see, Nick, is him hit in stride more often. You know, let's let's get the let's get 250 pounds of Kyle Pitts momentum going in a positive direction. He's dragging guys for six, seven yards before anybody even takes him down. So Leon, yes, I think Algier and Bijan will be enough. I think that's one of the reasons we saw so little of Cordero Patterson last year. Hopefully the Falcons will have more plays and you can spread the ball around a little bit, less three and outs. Because it seemed like when they ran up plays, it was second half, 12 play drives, handing the ball to Tyler Algier in the third quarter. Uh, I'd like to see a little more balance in that. But yeah, I think you're looking for maybe a third running back special teams guy emergency that maybe even you flex on and off the practice squad, Nick. Yeah, uh, you're looking. I mean, if you'd like a guy enough, Tyler Algier, is he going to be in the last year of his contract now or maybe two more years left this will be his third year so he was a late pick so i'm not sure i don't think you can add a fourth on that one can you it is i think it's four years out of the gate um for the non first round pick so you got two more years of control left you're probably not looking to force a pick at running back but there's a lot of value to be had this year late round three through round five at the running back position i know you just took Bijan, but at that point, you know, day three picks, what is the hit rate there anyway? Not very good. So if you see a running back you like, uh, day three, that can complement your room. I, I certainly think you look at something like that. Uh, probably probably even undrafted free agent. Next year's, not to get too far ahead, the 2025 running back class looks pretty darn good at this point. It's something crazy. It's got like 12 of the top 15 rushing yard leaders in college football last season are going to be back in college football, which just never happened. So there's going to be a lot of talent. Uh, that spot next year. So maybe you punt uh, for a season, but 
looking for positions there, no doubt. You'd probably find an undrafted free agent that can fill out your room just fine. Leaf wants to talk a little bit of Caleb Williams, you know, being upset after games, um, crying, you know, and, and showing up with the the pink at the USC game and stuff. And I don't know if that was just a reaction to him being asked, what do you think of a, of what would it be like if you had a, a gay teammate, whatever. And, you know, frankly, how grown up in Atlanta, I mean, this is, I think, number one overall for, uh, or, you know, per capita behind San Francisco for, for gay people. <laughs> I don't care, honestly. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in what his teammates think of him. And every report I've ever seen, they love him. You know, and that's that's what I want in my quarterback. He he could be just out there having fun. You know, if he was upset after a game, I, it's not going to sway me one way or the other. He certainly isn't afraid of the spotlight, and that's okay. So I'm I'm not again. I just I don't I don't care now. Think I don't know how old you are, Leaf. It was pretty crazy when Dennis Rodman was doing this stuff in the 90s when he started with the uh, the demolition man bleached hair and then he started putting colors in it and doing all kinds of showing up in boas and all that stuff. I was watching a Dennis Rodman comp today. What a freaking player he was. Guy could dominate a game without ever making a basket. It, that was 30 years ago. Now, dude, I don't I don't care. You know, do your teammates respect you? What kind of teammate are you? Do your teammates respect you? That's how I thought of Deion Sanders. Prime time was always a show. Oh, this arrogant uppity. You know what I'm talking about down here in the South, what he was getting called 40 years ago, 35 years ago, 89. He was putting on a show. He was putting on his brand. What do his teammates think of him? They loved him. Without a yeah. doubt, they loved him to a man. Yeah. So I'm not worried about it. If Caleb Williams busts, it's because he wasn't good enough. And as far as a prospect goes, I'd take him number one. Yeah, he's up there with Trevor Lawrence uh, as far as the tools. I, I mean, I don't know. I, everybody thinks like USC, right? Big brand football. That was a terrible USC team this year. It was like shocking to watch them play. Like when they played, was it Washington? Dylan Johnson, another day three running back option talking about there had like 180 yards before contact before, before contact before contact i mean this is the freaking usc they're they were horrible horrible on defense also they were absolutely dreadful on, on the offensive line i don't know if they have a single draftable player on that unit uh so caleb williams went into games being like if i don't put up 50 points we're gonna lose and you could feel that tightness uh and that that pressure to play that way it's uh kind of reminded me of like Mahomes in Texas tech where it's like, yeah, if we don't put up 50, we're not winning this game. Uh, so I, I'm not too really, I'm not worried about Caleb Williams. If any teammates have issues with him, it doesn't sound like that's the case at USC, but that's, I do think we're probably having times of changing there. You know, the, the, the millennials are taking over Gen Z even um, in yeah, those locker the rooms. Millennials are the coaches nowadays. Yeah. They're getting phased out. Yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a big, uh, I don't think it's an issue uh, really now. I think, I mean, also, also with the NIL stuff, we don't have as much money and fame questions anymore as guys come in. It's like, oh man, what's going to happen once he gets wealthy in the spotlight mm -hmm. on him? Brother, we're there. <laughs> he's he's totally <laughs> he's different. He's a millionaire honestly, for a couple of years now. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it might even be better with these guys coming in because you don't have like this millionaire living in this unbelievable flat in downtown LA talking to an offensive lineman who's worried about his calculus two test right now now they're going to be professionals in there on the same plane so i'm not i'm not worried about that stuff i'm i, I guess i'm more worried about the some of the people he surrounds himself with uh, it sounds like his father uh prickles some people and can be an issue and that you know who you surround yourself with can be a problem uh God, from time to time yeah that's, that's I mean, my advice dealing with recruits and being a dad right now it's hard yeah it is hard but try and arm your kids with as much information and decision-making tools as possible, and then shut up. <laughs> Sound, again, sounds like teams and people in the NFL, they're much more worried about Caleb Williams' father and his influence and being a distraction and stuff. than it's not going to stop him from going number one overall. No, it's not. Uh, and Edward Brown says, what are your thoughts on Nate Wiggins, cornerback out of Clemson, and do you think he lasts until pick 43? I'll hit the second part, and then I'm going to turn it over to Nick. No effing way. He lasts to 43. Top 20. Might be the first cornerback off the board. He's in there with four guys, I think. 
that will be in there. He's a he's a height, weight, speed, really, really physically gifted cornerback. Uh, and no, he's a guy that we could talk about targeting, trading back up into the first round. He's not going to be there in the second. He's probably not going to be there in the second. I will say, Scott, with the hip drop tackle rule that the NFL is imposing, players of Wiggins' weight would scare the absolute hell out of me because See, I can't. He wasn't 170. That was DJ James. He's 170. Um, I think he might be 170. Here we go. 173. Okay, he is a little per- bit lighter. The second percentile for cornerbacks. And let me tell you, the tape, the tackling on tape is bad too. So I, I do worry with how much middle of the field stuff we have, with how much zone coverage we have. Brother, your your tackles, your cornerbacks have to tackle. Uh, and with you cannot tackle from behind and drag anymore. So, I mean, he's talented. But I do think that some teams might be a little bit scared uh, by the physical tackling profile of Wiggins because you're going to have to be able to tackle in space. And I just, I didn't see it on tape. I honestly don't think the hip drop tackle is going to have the effect on the game and tackling negatively like people think. I really don't. I hope so. I, hope I so. just, you know, they they said when they came out, and this thanks to Lance Sanderson for looking this stuff up last night, I was listening to uh, to, to your show. You sit in for you on building the Broncos. And he says there was basically, there was like 269 instances where this, where they figured that a flag would have been thrown. That sounds like a lot. That was one per game, one per game, one tackle per game that looks to be illegal. And I don't know, man, did, did you guys grow up playing tackle football in this, in your yards and neighborhoods and stuff? I mean, yeah. we did, you know, we learned how to tackle, you know, you get your head out of there. Cause we weren't wearing helmets. <laughs> No. <laughs> you learned how to wrap up. You know, that's the thing. It's like wrap. If you wrap a guy up, you might get dragged around for a little bit if you're lighter, but you're going to make the tackle. So yeah. let's bring, let's bring tackling back. You know, I don't think people are talking about they're taking out of the game. No, I think they're trying to bring tackling instead of the hits, the lower, the helmets, crown of the helmets and throwing yourself on the back of people's legs. Let's bring back wrapping up and tackling. So yeah, no, I, I don't think Nate lat- lasts until uh, 43, but he's someone to watch for sure, Edward. He's he's pretty good player. He's going to be a first-round cornerback. Oblivion Empire, Jason, good to see you. He said, sorry I'm late, but I'm here. What did I miss? We have to go back and watch. I, I can't think back that far, man. Lion Here's coffee. to shiny foreheads. Absolutely. Let's go hit the like and get those smiles up, rise up. Appreciate you. Uh, Keith and Ellen Johnson came in with some stars, and he had a question to go with it. Now, how did I lose it? Uh, apologies. I don't remember what it was, and for some reason, I don't have it starred. I'll come back and find it, Keith. I know you had one, or put it back in here. Oh, here it was. No, it wasn't. Damn it. Put it back in there. I saw it, and um, I'll, uh, I want to hit that. Uh, one, of our, one of our OGs in here, Keith. Appreciate you. Uh, Mark says, coming in with a super chat, if Edge is the pick at eight, which seems highly likely, is it a slam dunk that it's Dallas Turner? Nick, what do you think? If they if they go edge at eight, will it be Dallas Turner? I think that's a pretty good bet. Uh, he is the youngest of the edge rushers, which to me matters. Uh, I think he's two or three years younger than Jared Verse. He is a better athletic profile than Verse, a bendier player, better ankle flexion, you know, that hoop drill kind of stuff. Verse is a little bit, he's such a power player, but uh, a little stiff uh, at the, in the, the lower half. Pause. That sounded bad, uh, but uh, you know, okay, not not always the best bend there. Um, and uh, so I don't I don't know if he's a slam dunk, but if it is an edge rusher at eight, I think he's the one I would lean into. Also, we've seen Morris work well with a little bit, you know, hybrid players as well. Uh, did some good things with Floyd, uh, Von Miller, etc. Out there, not that Von's a hybrid, but you know, not the classic four three edge. Uh, so I think Turner would be the pick there. I am curious. I. I think right now the betting odds are that Turner is the first defensive player drafted and off the board. There has been some swell, uh, groundswell recently for Kenyon Quinion Mitchell uh, from Toledo as well, potentially jumping Turner and maybe being the first. The one first, of the cornerbacks we talked about. Yeah, he, he could end up being the first defensive guy as well because he's, talk about size and tackling, he's very big, uh, which in a nickel cover to a two deep safety shell world where everything's in front of you, your cornerback's going to have to tackle in space and not worried about that with him. Uh, so keep an eye out for Mitchell as well. But if it is an edge at eight, I think it would be Turner. Uh, 
it does seem like the NFL draft is obviously teams are going to evaluate them differently, but the consensus is starting to solidify in the edge rusher ranking being Turner versus Latu Robinson. Yeah, Mark. So again, I don't think it's a slam dunk that it's Turner, but that's where I lean heavily. Uh, Mm -hmm. That's where, that's where I lean right now, um, for sure. Eddie coming in with some stars over on Facebook. And Keith's question was about Heineke. So we did get to it just because mm-hmm. we love you, Keith. He says, uh, I was surprised to see how low the salaries are for free agent quarterbacks are for non-starters. Has anyone signed Tannehill? So Tannehill's still out there. And the here's the thing, Eddie. The number has actually gone up yeah. for backup quarterbacks. However, I think the, the better way to put this is – I'm surprised to see the discrepancy in pay between starters and backups. It's usually about 5x at least. And that's it's one of the things we've talked about, you know, with Desmond Ritter and and I've said it before, I'll say it again. I don't really care who the backup quarterback is unless it's a rookie that you're talking about developing and could be a future starter because the veteran backup isn't good enough to win championships. They're just not on really any team. So, you know, the gone are the days where, what was it, Frank Wright came in, you know, for the Bills and uh, and, and engineered a big playoff victory. Was that, that was Frank Reich, I think, way back in the day. I got to go back 40 years for this, 30-something years. Yeah. And yes, there are exceptions, I know. But pretty much the rule is, in the NFL, you put so many resources into your starter. There's only so many good quarterbacks out there. If your starter goes down, you're screwed flat out. So again, I don't particularly care who the backup quarterback is. I care that my starter stays healthy. I care who my starter is and that he stays healthy. That's going to be the key to winning, not who your backup is there. But Eddie, the money has actually gotten better for the backups this year. There's $10 million backups, more than one. Yeah, the I would say that I've had the opposite pers- perspective here, Eddie. The backup money exploded this re- uh, this season. The Broncos were in on multiple backups, and then they saw what the backup quarterback market was getting paid, and they're like, "Actually, no, no, thank you." Uh, pause. Uh, like Darnold, they thought going in, you know, six, seven million, he gets ten million. Brissett, you know, five million. Marcus he gets- Mariota's getting that money. Marcus Mariota get- six plus over at Washington. Yeah. Uh, so the the backup quarterback market exploded this season. I don't think anybody's uh, any positions got more money from the cap ex, uh, leading up or explosion than the backup quarter. I guess maybe the guard market too, and maybe uh, some running backs got some decent money this year. Yeah, crazy uh, wide receivers not as much. I don't. We'll see. What, I think it's a lot to do with the draft, probably. I don't uh, know, man. You start talking twenty five million to Calvin Ridley and twenty million to Jerry Judy, and I'm gonna balk at the wide receivers not getting as much. $12 million sure. to Darnell Mooney. Yeah, true. Yeah, it's it was crazy to see the running back. 400 yards last year, $12 million. Yeah. There's a lot of them, but they're valuable, Scott. It's a scarcity versus impact <laughs> discussion that we like to have on here. Uh, but yeah, the I, Ryan Tannehill, keep an eye out for the Broncos there is all I will say on that one. Uh, sounds like there is at least smoke uh, for Denver on that one. Yeah, and, and Chris Walker brings in Nick Foles. Again, it's... It, as far as a guy who could come in and and do it, yeah. Again, there's there's exceptions out there. There are, and but the rule for the most part is, is it doesn't doesn't happen real often, uh, mm-hmm. where your your starter goes down and all of a sudden you're you don't miss a beat. If that happens, you're not a playoff team. <laughs> if that happens, your starter wasn't very good, and he was replaceable. A um, couple of questions in here over on Facebook. One from Nando Barrington and Mac Jones. They're both talking uh, Leatu Latu. Nando says, good day, fellas. How likely is it that we draft Leatu Latu at eight? And Mac Jones says, I'm really starting to like Latu, but maybe in a trade back. That's kind of where I feel about it. I don't know that I want Latu at eight, but I I don't mind a trade back, get another second round pick and some change and get Latu at 15 to 20, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to, I think, 15 to 25 range. He tested better than I expected, honestly, so good for him. Uh, the real question with him is the medicals. But I think, yeah, he's a really good football player. He's got a good bag. Early on, I just I don't know if I see him as a an early down player because I did not love the edge setting uh, from him on tape, but he's definitely versatile. His tape versus 
USC was fantastic. Uh, let's just be real. Uh, talk about Caleb Williams running for his damn life. Lots who they had him all over the place. That USC line was just seeing ghosts after that one, but uh, tested really well in the uh, explosives, uh, the speeds. So yeah, definitely somebody, if you trade back and he was okay with your medicals, uh, you should consider back there. The perfect combination or compliment to someone like Latu would have been Bud Dupree. Bud Dupree comes in, does the dirty work on first and second downs, and then you bring in Latu on third, uh, yeah. you know, or some variation of that. Cause, cause Bud Dupree doesn't have quite the explosiveness that he did years ago, but he was, you know, now he's grown man strong and he was setting an edge very well over there, you know, or you've got Calais Campbell back and you slide him inside on passing downs, that type of stuff. So, uh, I, I like Latu. I do. And do I want him at eight? There's there's going to be other players at eight, without a doubt, that I would rather have than Latu. But I'd be really happy with Latu. So if I can get Latu and a second round pick, turn that into, you know, there's lots of available players at second in the second, too. This, I love the second round of this draft, Nick. I love the first half of the first, and I love the second round. It's that. 15 to 30 range, 16 to 30, somewhere in there that I'm just kind of like, eh, I don't know if I want to use a first round on these guys. I'd rather use a second. Yeah, I feel like you have 12 to 16 guys that are first round grades. And then after that, pick 16 to 50, you know, put names in a hat and draw them out. I think it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty similar. So if you can get multiple picks in that range, I'd be fine. I think for where the Falcons are at right now, you already have a lot of picks. It might make more sense to like package some of those and try to get back up there for somebody on that back end of that tier. So maybe we can talk about that here in a bit. Uh, we got X stable, stabilized TV established, established. Okay. Stay established TV. <laughs> established uh, okay. TV. I think it's one uh, of those phonetic things, Nick, don't try and don't try and sound it out. It's, ex it's, it's phonetic. You hear it. I talk to myself all the time. I'm a little nuts. If I hear it, it makes more sense. Like established. Oh yeah, I get it now. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, better than X stabilized. Um, I think uh, I think we must take a quarterback. Uh, start investing in the future. I wish Penix or Travis or Spencer. I'll uh, have them learn behind Kirk. If Nix or Penix or uh, Rattler are there round three, then I think that's something you definitely consider. If you absolutely adore one of those quarterbacks and think they are just a slam dunk fit in your offense, they're round two. Maybe it's something to talk about, especially if you're moving around. Maybe you have a chance to like go back up into the second round and grab somebody uh, as well. But I think that's I would categorize those as the uh, my tier four quarterbacks in this class in uh, Rattler, Penix and Knicks and all of them. I could see coming off the board anywhere from 25 to 50. And I think all have a chance to be solid NFL starters uh, as well. So they make sense there in that range. Established TV. Thank you for the super chat. That feels like a first one for uh, for you. So thank you for. Uh... Trust in us and, and believing in the show and, and supporting us. On the surface, I think this statement's absolutely true because the Falcons will get a third quarterback. Mm -hmm. So where do they get him? How important do they prioritize it becomes a question because they want a third guy. They're not going to go into the season, go into camp with just two quarterbacks. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. no. So there will be a third guy that comes in. Now, do you sign him? from the free agent depths right now, or do you go draft a, if you've got enough picks, I don't mind using one on a rookie and just roll the dice, man. That's what it, that's what it is in the draft. And your odds of, you know, getting double sixes is pretty slim in the, uh, in the, in the day three, but it happens. So yes, the Falcons will get a third quarterback. Do they mm -hmm. get him in the, in the, in, in the draft? Maybe we will see. So, I uh, want to get back to the topic at hand, and one of the things I wanted to, t to talk about was uh, some of the the topics that Raheem Morris hit on, Coach Morris hit on uh, this week. One was Desmond Ritter. We talked about the tampering a little bit. He says, listen, I, I can't talk about it, but I feel pretty confident that we did the right thing, that we're okay there. Okay, well, we'll see. Uh, he talked about Desmond Ritter handling everything spectacularly. It wasn't Des come and asking for a trade. It wasn't them saying, hey, we're going to move you. It was an opportunity that presented itself from the Arizona Cardinals. They call up and say, hey, what do you think? And it was an opportunity for the Falcons to get faster, to add some speed to the wide receiver room, which looked to be a priority in this offseason with a couple of four, three wide receivers, Nick. Yeah, 
wanted to get speed in there. I that's one thing I don't think you can ever have enough of, especially in the the space game that this is this is becoming. We talk about here on a lot uh, on all the shows, Scott, but there are two I think real points of emphasis right now that analytics have shown how important they are uh, in determining wins and losses in football games, and those are turnovers. Of course, we've known that for a long time, but also explosive plays and explosive play. I mean, the whole reason that you have the match quarters defense, Vic Fangio style taking over and teams playing first and second down, like third down nowadays and light sub personnel on first and second down is because they're trying to take away explosive plays and it's much easier to get explosive plays through the pass game than the run game. So the ability to get speed on the field and create explosives is just, it's paramount. Uh, I wish I could find the stat. I was looking for it. Uh, there's some crazy percentage, Scott, that if you have a single explosive play on a drive, your chances for scoring a touchdown on that drive increase by like 7% or uh, se- seven times, not 7%. That's small, but like a crazy amount of the chance of points like explodes too. So if you can get a chance for explosives, that's huge. Also, there's such a huge correlation with explosive plays given up on defense and team records. It's one of the actually highest correlators to wins and losses. If you're a defense that doesn't give up explosive plays, odds are you're a pretty good team. Uh, so getting speed on the field really linked with the creating explosives and something that you want, especially if you have the, the baseline offensive line, like the Falcons already have established. Anthony Shea comes in. He says, Raheem Morris said he wanted to get younger guys to fill the secondary. Does this hint at a draft pick at cornerback? It's, it's, I don't know the guys as well. I think that's one of the reasons I have a harder time not drafting a quarterback. Uh, if we don't take one in the first round. A day two cornerback, I have a little bit more trouble finding a guy I like. That doesn't mean they're not there. It just means I'm ignorant. That's why I like having this guy with me too. But it also it puts he puts some faith into the guys that were already there. He mentioned Mike Hughes. He mentioned Clark. He didn't mention Richie Grant, and that might have just been an omission in there. Uh, but he mentioned D. Alford, ability to play some safety. But he, he didn't mention Richie, who was a starter last year. We'll see what that means, but we've said all along, Richie Grant is vulnerable. I'll be surprised if he comes back on a $4 million contract when he's only got an $800,000 dead cap hit. $3.2 million in safety. I could probably get two guys, uh, two veteran backups in there as well. Yes, Anthony, I think the Falcons draft at least one defensive back, Nick. Yeah, you're going to have options, uh, especially day two of the draft. I mean, heck, maybe even day one. If you trade back, I would be a little bit more open to cornerback moving off of eight into the middle of the first round. Uh, it does sound like there's some teams that would be eager to move up uh, for a potential Joe Alt or wide receiver as well to get ahead of the Bears. So you're in a good spot. I keep saying that. You're in a really good spot if you do want to trade back and kind of play the draft value game if you're not absolutely sold on a singular defensive player there at eight overall. We got Eric Noah coming in saying, what's your feeling on Cooper DeGene? I'm really sad that he uh, got injured. Well, as an Iowa fan, I'm sad he got injured, but we were robbed of his testing numbers at the combine. It sounds like he is a unbelievable athlete for the position. He's just a hard evaluation. I could go on for a while about this, Scott, because obviously I got my Iowa stuff behind me. Iowa plays so much off coverage zone that like is Cooper DeGene. Does he have man coverage ability? Does he have press ability? Maybe, but you don't really see it on tape because they don't ask him to do that. Uh, what does he have? Good ball skills, uh, really physical, and an unbelievable tackler uh, for that position. He's big, he's thick, he's well built. Uh, if you're a team that's going to play a lot of cover four, uh, off zone coverage, and ask him to come downhill and tackle, but not play you know as much you know in phase of the wide receivers, I think he can be a good boundary corner. But is he going to be able to play press man and stay with guys? Does he have the ability to you know click and close and change direction like that? I don't know. He's not like Wiggins in that regard, but he's just a totally different player. So it depends on the scheme. What I will say is that he has an unbelievably high floor because if he doesn't work at boundary corner, which you're going to let him try there first, he's going to end up being a really good safety that can come down and play some match coverage stuff from the slot. Uh, kind of a Harrison Smith, uh, Eric Weddle, Type maybe even a Tyron Matthew, but bigger. I mean, just the, the the ability to play safety and then play slot as well. The other thing about Cooper DeGene is that talking about the floor that he brings, he's going to be an unbelievably dynamic returner. And with the kickoff rules changing, that might be a little bit more valuable uh, than it used to be. So uh, it's kind of funny. We saw our guy uh, 
Cordell Patterson get signed immediately after that rule change was announced. I don't know if that's a, that's a surprise at all, but uh, Cooper Jean, if he doesn't work at boundary corner, he's going to end up being a heck of a defensive back, smart player, great tackler, physical, instinctual, and again, a good athlete. I'm waiting for that Iowa pro day. Um, there's a lot of hype for that. He's going to test. Well, I'm, I mean, pro day numbers, it used to be that pro day numbers are always better since they updated the turf in Indy. That's not always the case. <laughs> Why anymore. wouldn't you run in Indy? Why uh, wouldn't you run a 40 in Indy? It's the freaking Bonneville salt flats. Now. Yeah. Nowadays you, you should, if they don't run an Indy, we got questions, uh, but he's a, he's a really high floor player. And I can't imagine him not going in the first round unless he flubs the pro day, which I just, I don't think it happens. Tyler is a Bama fan and he likes Turner on this. Sometimes that doesn't work that way. You know, you, you've seen a guy you're like, listen, I watch this guy a lot. Sometimes familiarity can be breeds contempt or paralyzation by analyzation. I've seen this guy. I've seen all his weaknesses where I just saw a flash of this guy and I haven't had time to pick out all of the reasons not to like him. So very interesting. I've never had an edge to root for since I've been a Falcon. He's getting a Turner jersey if the Falcons take him. Ryan Adonis, good to see you, my friend. Great to have you in here today. He says, can't wait to see Patterson get three carries in three weeks for this year. You think he'll get three? Uh, Arthur Smith strikes again. That said, he should get at least three, 17 points, four. That'd be four kickoff returns. He should get four kickoff returns. I'm not sure he had four kickoff returns last year. And as far as a rule change, I'm glad they're trying something, Nick. You've heard me rail about the kickoff since we've been doing this. I said, just get rid of it. It's a waste of freaking time. All right, well, here's a way to try and bring something back into the game. I like having alternatives to the NFL where they can try these things. You know, instead of the monopoly that was the NFL and then everything filters down downstream to college and, and, uh, and to high school, I like having different variations that they're willing to try this. I don't know if it's going to work, but something had to be done. And mine was just scratch it completely. So I don't know if I like this rule, but I like that they're changing what it was because what it was was Cordero Patterson doing this. And for those of you listening, I'm just watching a ball fly out of the end zone. And it was a waste of time. This is something. This is, we'll see. We'll see how it works out, but I'm glad they're they're doing it. Yeah, uh, without a doubt, I'm excited to see it. That's the one rule change that I'm excited about. The other stuff, not so much, uh, but... We'll see how it works out. We I see Mike Harvey also asking a lot of cornerback questions. Did you see what Kamari Lassiter ran at the Georgia Pro Day? I did not. It was like four six for mm. a cornerback. That's death. Uh, so he's probably I would not take him. He might even be off my board running a four six as a cornerback. Uh, so if that's a would not be interested there. I'm much more interested in another a number of other cornerbacks. Uh, DJ James stands out for me. Max Melton I like a heck of a lot. Uh, the uh, Cam Hart, Andrew Phillips, Jarvis Brownlee. Those are all names that if the four, six is verified, which I think it is, uh, would not be super interested in Lassiter. They, when they did those in high school, they used to run them on the track. So they, I don't think they're doing that anymore for the NFL, but you know, you, you when you're recruiting guys, you want them to feel good about when they're leaving. So <laughs> I've actually been at college camps for high school guys where they'd go four, three, two. And then they'd turn around to the guy that's writing it down four, five, two. <laughs> so it's always, it's always, I ran a four, three, two night. No, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. Four, six um, is scary. Four, six is a little guy. scary. That's my, that's my lowest point. That's the enough factor. Okay. That's enough. Just barely. Now let's see. Do you have the size to play some safety to move inside? And, and can you ball? I mean, Tyra Matthew wasn't much faster than that. You know, there are exceptions, of course. How good of a player are you? When I think of awesome football players who aren't overly physically gifted, Tyra Matthew is one of the first guys I come up with. He's He probably tested a little better than 4'6", but he wasn't a sub 4'4 guy. Um, but he was just... It, it, another one at LSU, the um, Jarvis Landry. I had Jarvis Landry when he was in high school at like four, eight, three. And I put five stars next to his name because he played fast and all he did was get open, make catches and beat people. So again, if I'm ranking him, that was different. That was a long time ago, but it doesn't take him off the board, but it slides him down some. That's for absolute sure. If you love him, you're happy he ran a four, six. If you love him, the way he plays, the speed of the game, the GPS data, et cetera, et cetera. You're like, yes, I can get him in the fourth. I'm excited about this. 
And, uh, you know, Anthony Evans talking about the hip drop thing. The hip drop tackle thing is going to be awful. We need to run uh, Tyler Algier and Bijan all day. Again, I, I don't expect it to make that big of a difference. And someone asked, what exactly is the hip drop? Where they're calling this is it's like, think of it like a slingshot. I'm grabbing onto waist and I'm pulling and kicking my own legs out underneath me and sinking my butt into the back of the defender's legs. You don't have to do that to make a tackle. And it, it is, it's dangerous as hell. When you see it, you cringe. You know, when you see when you see a running back coming through the lines and roll up one of his offensive lines, uh, one of his offensive linemen, and he, you know, jerks back like he's been shot. It's scary. Mm -hmm. So again, I actually think a lot of these moves are to bring tackling back into the game, not to take it out. Now, this is a hip drop tackle. I know. But I can I understand why the, after watching it become a controversy last year and I started looking for it and I saw a couple of these, you get a defensive tackle grabbing onto a guy and sinking back into the back of his knees. I don't like it. You don't have to tackle that way to make tackles. So we'll see. I know not everybody's going to agree with me, and that's okay. I just I don't think it's going to affect people. I don't think it's going to affect the game as nearly as much as it will help the guys who don't get broken legs or torn knees. So we'll see. I'm really concerned about the subjectivity of it, Scott. And I foresee it being something that superstar teams in crucial situations have it called for them and bails them out. I just envisioning the Broncos who nobody gives a flying hoot about at the NFL right now, landscape uh, going against the chiefs and it's fourth and 20 and um, Patrick Mahomes throws it short of the sticks and oh hey it's a hip drop tackle first down uh go go chiefs says the nfl uh, taylor swift does a halftime show at that point or something i don't know uh <laughs> but that's that's my concern is the subjectivity of it and just the inherent bias that we have towards the superstar quarterbacks from a officiating perspective not that i'm saying it's rigged but there's like a, a by it's like an nba right lebron james oh he's gonna get the freaking call there's just yeah. that perspective of it so i'm worried about the the subjectivity of it yeah i i agree on that it does and it's just Kennedy says it uh it puts more on the refs it is and f refs he says take away the helmets and you solve the issue i've said this for years it'll never happen it, it, it will never ever 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 happen but you want to remove the concussions as crazy as it sounds take away the helmets guys heads are staying out of it now you'll still have somebody go down and hit their head and i i know yeah. but you'll You'll take away, you'll, you'll break more noses. <laughs> to me, it's kind of like MMA versus boxing, and I've used this analogy before. MMA, you're more likely to get bloodied up or have something broken. Boxing, you're more likely to be killed. Yeah. You know, so you're more likely to have less serious injuries if you remove the helmets, but you're less likely to have brain damage, as crazy as that sounds. Anyway, on that note, I wanted to do a one last thing real quick on, um, on Raheem Morris. He did say he met with Calais Campbell, at least talked with him, and he's looking forward to talk with him more, present the vision, so it sounds like the Atlanta Falcons would be happy to have Calais Campbell back. And Nick, frankly, I'd be happy to see Calais Campbell in an Atlanta Falcons uniform. How about y'all, Falcons fans? A-plus person, uh, fun player. I mean, just one of the most underrated players of the last decade, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know if he'll be a Hall of Famer. Maybe he should be, uh, but just – adore Calais Campbell. I don't know how he felt to the second round being such a freaking size guy back when he was drafted. I don't know if there th couldn't be any off the field issues because he's an incredible person. So I, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. Uh, maybe he's, Oh, he doesn't really fit this box. Well, he's big and he can play. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was an old, uh, I think a lot of y'all know I went to Auburn and when Terry Bowden was at, uh, was at Auburn, there was a running back ended up at Arkansas and I can't remember his name but he was really, really good at Arkansas. And they Auburn passed on him. And the guy recruiting him who couldn't get the thumbs up to offer him a scholarship to come in was, what was it? What was the problem? Was he too big or too fast? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so I want to do a mock draft, y'all. Uh, and yeah. I want to do this. I'm just going to set it up for the first round where we do it nice and slow, where it comes in and we can see the trade possibilities that are available to us. So let me uh, let me get this set up here. And uh, Oblivion Empire, Nick, hit on this one real quick while I'm getting to this set up. Yeah, back to the leather helmets. 
I mean, I, I know that they use the guardian helmets in practice a lot. I know it's honestly more to protect the quarterback's hands for a lot of those. Cause that's, you know, the issue when they, in, in practice, they'll have to do a pass and the handle come down and nick a helmet and break a finger. But I know the aesthetics of the shiny helmet are nice, but just get something in there that works. I don't, I don't really care. Protect their heads. If it means that they're wearing helmets that like inflate on compact, I, I don't know, figure out something. We got, we got technology these days. There's gotta be something that can uh, lower the damage and take away a lot of the inertia of the tackles. And if, if it doesn't look cool, who cares? Who yeah. It, like I said, it'll never happen, but you know, the old saying, see what you hit that solves it all, you know, see, see what you hit. That means tackling with your face and you don't, you don't have a problem anymore. So, uh, and Keith Cassidy says, uh, you know, hell yeah. Calais Campbell is a massive personality. Love him. And he was really, really good last year. So, uh, Okay, let's uh let's let's this is the Nick. If you've got to go take care of uh some some daddy business, we can finish this, but this shouldn't this shouldn't take too long here. We got it. We'll get going here. Um I've got it set up. It's just a one round draft. Either we're only gonna do one on this one. And uh let me see it. Let me hit the start draft on this. Uh the bears are on the clock, and this is going a little bit slower. We'll let this run because we're not gonna trade up. It's actually going a little faster than I was hoping. <laughs> so the Falcons have 10 trade possibilities. And look, we've talked about it before. If everybody is going, if it's going to be four quarterbacks and three wide receivers, somebody is dropping. Somebody mm -hmm. is dropping. Is it yeah, Joe, Alt? Joe Alt? I know there's been some talk here from Falcons fans, and I agree that Joe Alt could be a possibility where you make, where, where you take him. Kayla McGarry is a little bit of a liability, I'm understating here, as a liability in pass protection. Can he get better this year under a new system, more time in the league, et cetera, et cetera, or is he a problem? Because if he is back to his 2021 days, it's a problem. Your whole offensive scheme is wrecked if he's a turnstile. So you've got some trades here. Uh, your next trade is the New York Jets at 10. Sure, I'd be happy to move down to 10. What can I get out of it? Do they have uh they don't have the problem is everybody who wants to trade with me doesn't have a number two? I'm not taking a date 2025 pick. Give me 2025. Well, that's no well, of course we're not drafting in the second round anyway. Yeah, we could get 10 and a and a round two next year. That's fantastic. To move back two spots and still yeah, have a me, chance at the def defensive players. Hell yeah. Yeah. So again, just some of the options here. Who else is in here? The Saints at 14, the Colts at 15. So these are the type of options. I want a second rounder this year, though. So let's say we did trade back just a little bit. They're oh. not going to take it. Baloney. Then to hell with you. We'll trade with somebody else. If I can find it here. Hands, Jets. Can't. Nah. We're not trading <laughs> with New Orleans. The Colts, yeah. We'll go to 15. We're not trading with New Orleans. And... Let's see. That is some reason. It's golly. I, I've got it zoomed 15. in. Eight and 15. And you want, I want 46. 46. And then a, let's get it. And I want a 2025 third. Maybe send it back a fourth next. They might not. Trade not accepted. You know what? The hell with all of y'all then. No, give well, send them back a 20. Give Send them a fourth. I'm not sending them back. They didn't like okay. it. We're going to draft a player. All right. Sounds good. So here's I've, your chance again. Your your edge rushers are here. They're not as high on some of these guys. They have Dallas Turner. They really, really like the corners. Cooper DeJean, Quinion Mitchell. I'm still going Dallas Turner here if I stick at eight. Let's stick at eight. Uh, maybe we'll have another chance uh, later on to uh, do the thing where we move back some and then maybe move back up or how that works. But uh, yeah, let's let's keep let's just, some of the guys we're targeting. Uh, if we take edge here. Cooper DeGene will never make it on this board, but that's somebody I'm looking at at the back end. See if Quinion Mitchell falls. Nate Chazan. Wiggins could fall and Terry on Arnold. So there's four corners I'm looking at right there that could, could end up dropping down. So let's let's go ahead and take uh, Dallas Turner and then see how it goes. Huaga, Fashano, Verse, Bowers. So there's still four corners, four corners, four corners. Arnold there's, is one. Quinion is two. All right, now I'm slowing down because there's one more corner I like, and I don't want him to get taken. So there's still two corners I like. And 
I'm running out. So I'm going to go resume until the last one goes because I'm still targeting a quarter here. J.C. Latham, Byron Murphy, tackle, tackle, corner. Nate, there's, there's one more left. Three of the corners I liked got taken. Now I'm at 23 with uh, the Minnesota Vikings on the clock. So if I'm going to trade now, their 11's gone. What do I offer them to move up? I want 23. It probably takes 43 and second, 74. And one of the thirds, they like that. What if I took away that one and gave them the Calvin Ridley pick? They might bulk at it, but uh, you never know. Man, they are not happy today with this. All right, it might cost me my 74 instead of my 79. What the hell? <laughs> rejected rejected everything's rejected okay you can have a 2025 seventh if they were if... all right screw I, I feel like Resume something's draft. wrong with this one of these should have been accepted by now yeah you think this has that an 82 percent chance if it says no to that one then there we go all right so i made the cooper de Jean still on the board done all right or i can get latu layatu latu is still there as devron says Leatu Latu. I I think you can probably still get a good cornerback later on. I know you just gave up two picks, but uh, I might lean Latu. Get the pass rushers in there. I might go Latu also. And I just we talked about it earlier, Nathan. Uh, Lasseter ran a four six one and a four six three at his pro day. He's not a cornerback. I I'm sorry uh, that he's gonna plummet with numbers like that, uh, Scott. I I actually disagree with you that four six is not the enough factor you need to be running four five it, it depends i mean you you start thinking it, it it goes with the size who was the big kid from uh from compton that went to uh stanford and then played with the legion of boom richard sherman richard sherman was a four six guy but he was six foot three he was you know, massive so the part of it lasseter's probably not six foot three also he was a he sherman ran a four four five or four five five yeah, so it's basically on a day where he gets a gust of wind in his face, it's a four six. Yeah, you know, that's... so that's that's close enough. But again, Lasseter's probably not six foot three. And two hundred and fifteen. Yeah, pounds. he's not you don't have the size, the size thing. So it is a size frame thing. So also you again, can't just I don't mind like Lasseter on day three if he's running no. four sixes. Maybe he had a bad no. day, his stomach is upset. I, I don't know. Do I trust my evaluation on tape? If I do, then I don't mind taking a flyer on a guy who could be a really good special teams player. Yeah. I'm not taking him off my board completely if I like him. Yeah. I don't know enough about him otherwise. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. If I was if he on him before, then he's out. I'm like, okay, this is a day three guy that I'm interested in. Yep. We'll see how he runs. Oh, now I'm not interested anymore. If I love this guy and he, I love the way he plays football and he's just eaten up as a player, these are the kind of guys that you know, the, the playoff teams end up taking and they've got really good football players. Yeah. So Latu, Alton Latu, I'd be ecstatic. Oh, I could really go corner on here. Uh, you know, Johnny Newton is really good, but uh I'd be I could go lot to not double up on my edges here, y'all. Yeah, let's let's do it. I think that there's a huge drop off and I think that uh, getting the pass rushers, you talk about it, when's the last time the Falcons have been able to get after it? No, I mean, no, we can't take another pass rusher. We have too many. Baloney. Never happened. <laughs> so those of you who wanted, Cooper Jean goes at 25, Darius Robinson right there. There's a versatile lineman. Johnny Newton, Kool-Aid McKinstry. And there it is. So I made a trade. I got Dallas Turner. I sent a second 74 and a 2025 fifth to come back up and get my second, my second edge or one of the corners. Cause that's where I hit pause. Y'all remember I was watching the corners and there were four of them that I targeted in the first round. As soon as three of them were gone, I hit pause. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm looking for. Who are the going to be the available options? I'm targeting a corner. I like four. How far can they go down before I end up? Okay, now all three of them are gone. I want one of these guys. What's it going to cost me? Cost me a second and a third to move back up into the first. How realistic is that, Nick, do you think? 
think it's, I don't know if it's realistic for the Falcons to move back up for an edge. If you already got that given the, oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, how realistic is it to jump 20 spots with a third round pick? Considering how high 43 is as well. That's, that's realistic. That's about what it would cost. Uh, I think, especially when you're talking about non quarterback options there, uh, you gave up two top 100 picks, uh, Honestly, I don't even know if the fifth rounder in 2025 would matter or get it done. Uh, you might be able to get it done without that. So, yeah, I think uh, I think that is realistic for sure. The, the, the cost there. So, again, there's some talk in here about, you know, um, about Kamari Lasser and Richard Sherman. Again, I, I don't like to make except, you know, to the rule. There's exceptions to every rule usually you want to draft by the rule if you try and build a team with exceptions you're going to be in trouble so again i'm not advocating for lassiter in the second round i'm not even advocating him at for him at all i'm yeah. saying i'm not taking a guy off of my board at defensive back if he runs a four six completely if i already love him so yeah. and, and sherman was sherman was an exception there's not many six three corners out there period um he was he was pretty special and again it takes a lot of a human being to come out of, I, I know where he went to high school. I've been there to come out of there and end up at Stanford to have success. Nothing but respect for what Richard Sermon survived. Yeah. And then was able to go on and thrive. I so also again, don't know if you can live in a, that type of coverage world anymore. The game has changed. When you had Dan Quinn, and the Seahawks, it was okay. You know, what we're running. Cover three. Oh, you're tired of that? We're going to run more cover three. It's, now you're playing so much uh, coverages where you're disguising beforehand. You're playing inverse, uh, invert cover two. I I mean, Sherman would still be a good player to the end today. Don't get me wrong. But I think he was definitely right time, right place, right scheme uh, to really take off. I don't, I don't know if he's versatile enough to be a as as translatable the here's defense the, here's has the changed thing, so much before the they change the surface before they change the surface in indy the average 40 time was like four five eight for cornerbacks at the nfl combine seriously seriously it was the average there and it was the fastest so i've always had that four six mark in my head as this is enough enough for for you to make my board i'm not crossing you off it if you're four six Five. basically it's four six five and inside linebackers was like four eight three before they changed the surface that was the average time now again it's the bon bonneville salt flex the counter to that that you want to say is yeah but he didn't run it indy he ran it his own freaking pro day under the optimal conditions i get that again we're spending too much time on this <laughs> i just want to say real quick the average 40 time for starters in the nfl at cornerback uh, according to nfl.com is four four eight? Mm -hmm. That's a big difference. Four four eight to four six. So that's, when that's you're talking averages, and we know how many four threes there are, we know there are some four sixes also. Four six does not get you out of the NFL. And there's guys yeah. that are playing that are in their late twenties that can't run a four four eight anymore. I promise you that. But it takes you out of the top one hundred. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what that's yeah. what I'm saying. It doesn't remove him from my board completely. That's that's all I'm saying. Especially for somebody who's only one 185 which is average size right for a cornerback yep average size and slow doesn't play at the athlete position that is cornerback <laughs> yeah, old um, and expensive you know slow yeah. isn't necessarily good and cam hart is a bigger guy cornerback from notre dame absolutely so again would we double up on edge maybe but i wanted y'all to see the kind of options and what it might take because trading back up into the back end of the first round for the atlanta falcons makes some sense for one of those guys let's say you took Joe Alt. Okay, well, now I get Joe Alt. I get a franchise left tackle for the next generation. And I still get Layatu Latu. Let's say I need my cornerback number two. Cooper DeGene was still there. Of the four guys that I was targeting, he was still there. He could still be there. So it opens up the options of, I don't necessarily, I can go one of three or four different ways at eight or come down even a little bit and still come back up into the first and get a dude. So I wanted you to see what the different options were there. Not necessarily, hey, this is what we do. Now, the options we had today, want to say thank you to Jason, Oblivion Empire, Established TV, Eddie, uh, Fujioka, Mark Wilson, Keith and Ellen Johnson, Edward Brown, Mike Harvey, 
Mark Schrader coming in a couple of times, and of course, Michael Sunrise Tranquillo. I will be back on Friday, and we may do this all over again because it's fun. And uh, we'll talk some Falcons. And as a programming note, I will not be here next week. And then off the next Monday, it is spring break. And for the first time, we're not playing baseball. I'm going on spring break for a week. So we'll be back Friday will be the last show. This is the last time you will see Nick for two weeks, unless you go over to youtube.com slash mile high huddle and see him. So we're going to get out of here. Nick, any last final thoughts and keep them quick. Uh, definitely want to keep them quick. We'll see what happens with the Falcons. Fun to go back for back-to-back pass rushers there. And we're in the home stretch now. Uh, so really exciting stuff. And we'll be a little break here with Scott going on spring break, but draft coverage is going to continue. So fun show. And we'll, we'll be back tomorrow morning with the Broncos. Yep. Thanks for being here. Y'all have an excellent rest of your week. We'll see you on Friday. Peace.